Hi, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we'll give a couple more minutes to wait for everyone to come into our webinar. Uh, and then we'll start it. Thank you very much. So hi everyone, welcome to those that have just arrived. We're just giving a couple more minutes to wait for people to join our webinar. Uh, the traditional five minutes. So let's just wait a couple more minutes and then we can start our webinar. Well, I think we can start. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending where you are. My name is Andrea Almeida da Vila. I'm an officer at the Innovative Finance Team here at ECLA World Secretariat. And we're truly excited to have you all here today in this webinar called Tapping into Private Sector Investments for Nature-Based Solutions and Biodiversity Projects. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today in this important conversation. And thank you especially to our incredible speakers whose expertise, insights, and experiences are the foundation of this webinar. So a big thanks to Mr. Azia Robles and Ms. Panchwilian. And in today's webinar, as the title suggests, we'll look into private financing and funding and how this can be leveraged by local and regional governments to effectively implement biodiversity projects and nature-based solutions. So it's well known that this biodiversity projects generally struggle to attract, to attract private financing and have therefore historically relied on public resources and instruments. So, but however, our, as our speakers here will show today, this trend seems to be shifting and a growing number of local governments have successfully financed their biodiversity projects with the support of private, of private resources. Public-private partnerships are of course the main vessel, the main instrument for this, not only for leveraging private financing, but also for leveraging the expertise and the business capacities of the private sector who also engages in the management of the project. However, PPPs are filled with challenges and are not simple to be established, requiring a lot of capacities from governments, but also the need to balance public and private interests. Still, there are an auspicious avenue in bridging the gap in biodiversity, in biodiversity finance. 
So to speak about these challenges and opportunities today, I'm joined here by Mr. Azir Abaunza Robles, who is the Councillor for Urban Planning, Strategic Projects and Public Space in the city of Bilbao in Spain, and who will speak about the public-private partnership which was established to redevelop the Zoho Tsaure district in Bilbao. We're also joined here by Ms. Panchvelian, Deputy General Management Manager of Industry Department in the Belt and Road Environmental Technology Exchange and Transfer Center in Shenzhen, China, who will address the Belt and Road Corporation case sharing in the city. So quickly, before we go into the presentations of our invited speakers, I will very briefly present our new Guide to Biodiversity Financing for Cities and Regions, which was developed here at ICLE within the frame of Interact Bio. We will then move into Mr. Robles' presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A, and then by Ms. Panchelian's presentation in Shenzhen, which will also be followed by a Q&A. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, first, I'd like to mention that Ms. Trillian's presentation will be done in Chinese and will count with the consecutive translation of our ICLE East Asia colleague, Yi Jiang, who will translate. So Ms. Pan Trillian will present each slide, and then after each slide, uh, Yi Jiang will translate that slide in very briefly. Uh, as I mentioned, each session will be followed by a Q&A, so we would also like to strongly invite you to pose your questions in the dedicated Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then we'll read these questions to the speakers. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, I will start sharing my screen to share my presentation. Uh, I believe you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. OK, perfect. So as I mentioned, I'll present the guide to biodiversity financing for cities and regions, which was developed within the framework of Interact Bio here at ICLEI. Uh, and to kick off our discussion, I think it's important for us to start discussing why it is important to address financing for biodiversity projects. So why are we talking about PPPs and ways to leverage private financing? Or in other words, why are we looking into new financial instruments and mechanisms to implement this biodiversity projects. Well, as it is the case with climate financing, there is a very big gap between the existing funds directed to biodiversity and the resources that are actually needed to adequately, adequately preserve it. Uh, this is a gap estimated at around $711 billion. Uh, but unlike climate financing, biodiversity financing has some particularities which make its financing landscape a bit more tricky. So this makes that the overwhelming majority of biodiversity investments today are financed by public funding or philanthropic funding. And there's a few reasons for that, but the main reason is that it is very difficult for these kinds of projects to attract private finance because they usually have a lower revenue or commercial potential than other types of climate projects, let's say an energy or mobility project, for instance. Uh, this is partly due to the fact that it's very hard to quantify the value of nature and biodiversity. So we don't, it's hard to put a monetary value into these kinds of natural assets, which are usually seen as common goods. But it doesn't help also that the regulatory frameworks are not as well developed and that these projects tend to be smaller scale, which makes replicability and scalability very difficult. And there lies the importance of this innovative financing instruments, which manage to blend different sorts of financing and help reduce the risks of these biodiversity projects, thereby increasing its capacity to attract private financing. So hence why we produced this guide, uh, it aims to serve as a one-stop shop for local and regional government to enable the development of urban biodiversity projects, that is projects for conservation, restoration, and preservation of biodiversity. It includes a general landscape on the main notions, concepts, definition, and resources uh, important for biodiversity financing. It also has this overview of the main actors and sources for biodiversity financing. But more importantly, it includes a very comprehensive and detailed description of the financing instruments for these kinds of projects, each of the instruments illustrated by case studies. So I think this is a very rich part of this guide. Uh, uh, it really helps understand what are the 
instruments and opportunities available for biodiversity financing. And it's complemented by a biodiversity finance decision-making tree, which seeks to help decision policy and decision makers to best choose their instruments for the biodiversity projects and a catalog of financing opportunities for these projects. So I will focus on the last three components of the guide that I listed here, which for me are related to the richest part of the guide, looking at the financial instruments and their availability to local governments to carry out biodiversity projects. Uh, but I really recommend to everyone reading this guide. I think it's very useful, it's very rich, and can really help you enable and implement yeah, the biodiversity project in your city. So, of course, before policymakers have to go over the available financing uh, options for a project, uh, they should do their homework, let's say, and create an enabling environment to unlock and access financing to biodiversity projects. I'm not going into detail in this, but this involves creating a proper regulatory environment, guaranteeing political support for biodiversity agenda and the biodiversity projects that are part of their agenda, and establishing a broader investor-friendly environment, guaranteeing that the but also guaranteeing that the local government has the capacities to effectively develop and implement this kinds of project in partnership with the private sector. And here we're not only talking about implementation, but about the whole project development cycle, uh, which is of course very challenging to, to our many local governments to have the capacities to adequately manage this project development life cycle. Uh, I think it's also important to make this conceptual differentiation that we make uh, in the guide, which is the difference between the traditional and uh, what we call the innovative financial instruments. So in the traditional instruments are the bread and butter of local, of local project financing in general. They generally rely on public resources, uh, generally collected by the municipality or through intergovernmental transfers. And they represent the large majority of biodiversity financing. And they're not traditional because they're necessarily older, they're just more commonly used and are, let's say, easier to understand for most people. However, as we also mentioned, they are not enough, uh, hence the gap that exists in biodiversity financing. So we have this innovative financing instruments, which are not necessarily new, but are capable of unlocking investments by blending different funding sources and better distributing the risks for projects, which allows it, them to catalyze collaboration among different stakeholders, including private ones. So these are the ones that I like to bring your attention to when you read the guide. We go, as I mentioned, we go in depth into each one of them, providing case studies to show how they have been used in different contexts. Uh, not always the innovative financing instrument will be the most adequate instrument. So it's good also to balance how to choose each instrument. Uh, and to help you do this, that's why we have developed this biodiversity finance decision-making tree. It precisely seeks to help local government and officials to navigate among the numerous financing instruments available and help them find the most suitable one for the project, considering the local conditions and the capacity to, of the local government also to access international finance. So here we have to wear the hat of local government official and we reply yes or no to the questions that are posed on the left-hand side. And depending on the answer here, we can go to one or another instruments or even blend different instruments to finance one project. So here I like to look at one specific case study of PPP, since this is a topic we're talking about today, and see how the tree can help choosing that instrument for the specific project. So as I am Brazilian and I am from Sao Paulo, I will talk about the case of Sao Paulo for the PPP for the management of municipal parks in the city of Sao Paulo. Um, so this PPP was for the management and operation of the parks of six parks in Sao Paulo, which included the city's main park, Ibirapuera, and five parks in the city's outskirts. Uh, and here the local government required that the private partner invested $34 million in these parks, including in the preservation and conservation of biodiversity in these parks. So strong focus on the on the flora of the parks. But what is interesting here is that first they did a bundling with other parks. So Ibirapuera, them city's main park, had a big revenue potential 
through ancillary revenues such as restaurants and other kinds of shops, which guarantee the attractiveness of, the, of this project to private investors. But at the same time, they bundled Ibirapuera with five parks in the outskirts, which did not have this revenue potential. So, so this guarantee the financial feasibility of the project while ensuring that this outskirts parks, which would normally struggle to attract private financing were also included in the project. So I think this case is very interesting to showcase how uh, PPPs first can be used for biodiversity, to, to finance biodiversity projects, but also to showcase how a biodiversity finance decision-making tree can help you choose the best interest uh, instrument. I have another case study here that I will skip. Uh, but this also raises, this raises the question of where and how to access the instruments that we list in our guide. So we need so much financing and there are the tools to access it, but where is actually the money to access them? And to help navigate in this as well, we produced as part of our guide, a catalog which provides a comprehensive list of 62 programs, instruments and opportunities for biodiversity financing, not only for project implementation, but also for project preparation. So through project preparation facilities in all regions of the world and from a diversity of different financing institutions. And here, as you can see, it already provides a brief description of the type of support provided here on the right hand side. So you can also look what type of support you need and look in the guide for this type of support and what programs and opportunities are offering it. So given an example here as well of how this catalog works, we can look here at the Asian Development Bank, for instance, and we'll look at the Urban Environmental Infrastructure Fund that it provides. We see that the type of support it gives is grants for technical assistance and investments. And then we can click on the link provided here and get more details about the eligibility criteria, the requirements for the project to access this fund, et cetera. So one quick example is how, for instance, this fund here, Urban Environmental Infrastructure Fund helped found the Hunan Xinjiang River Watershed Solid Waste Comprehensive Treatment in China. Uh, it gave 1.15 million dollars for the for the production of technical study and was part of a larger package of 150 million loan from the ADB for waste infrastructure investments in 10 counties and cities in Hunan, China. So I gave a quick overview of our guide. I hope it interested you. Uh, and once again, I really recommend everyone reading it. I think it's it can be very useful for officials and for local governments in general to better understand this intricate landscape of biodiversity financing. Uh, so yes, I think Maria will share the links to the to the guide here in the chat. So please feel free to use these links to to access it. And thank you very much. And now I'll stop sharing my screen. And we can go into the presentations from our invited speakers. So we'll now go to the presentation of Mr. Azia Baunza Robes. We'll present the public private partnership to redevelop the Zorro Taure district in Bilbao. Uh, Azier is an agriculture engineer and environmental impact specialist who has served as city councillor in Bilbao since 2007. He initially served in, the, in traffic and transportation, but later assumed roles in urban planning, public works, and urban rehabilitation in the city. Before joining politics, Azier also worked in the Department of Urban Planning in the government of Biscaya, taught at the Dario Agrarian School and served as an advisor to the General Secretariat of the for of Foreign Affairs for the Basque government. So uh, Azier, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, André. And thank you very much for sharing the guides. Uh, I think it'll be interesting. Um, I will share my, my screen. Uh, one moment, please. Well, Um, first of all, I must explain that uh, this is probably Thorothobre Island project is probably the, the flagship or the, the main uh, urban transformation project that we are developing actually in, in the city of, of Bilbao. It's a, it's a quite, uh, for the size of Bilbao, it's quite huge for, for us to manage. And I think it's a very good example of that 
public-private partnership uh, in, in the development of uh, an urban transformation. I must say that uh, as we are talking about the district that it's in the city center, uh, the projects that we will see are not connected with the restoration of a wild nature uh, in the riverbanks of this new neighborhood, but in the urban transformation of a previous existing industrial area in the city center of the, of the village of the city of Bilbao, and with the uh, transformation of those riverbanks in new green areas and pedestrian areas, in gaining new parks in a place where previously there were none of them. Uh, as you can see in these pictures, you can see how it was previously. The, this area of Zorrozaurra is an artificial peninsula in the middle of the river that previously was completely occupied by port activities and many kind of industries connected with the steel transformation. In fact, one of the main producers of steel chains of the world was located here. Here that we were producing those huge chains that are holding the petrol stations in, in the sea. Uh, they were made in, in this place, for example. So as you can see, there was no uh, green area in the whole area of uh, this uh, peninsula of Zorro Zaurre. And the master plan that was designed by Zaha Hadid uh, is planning a new district in, in this space, opening the canal to transform the peninsula in, in an island and with a mixed used uh, urbanism in, in the whole uh, neighborhood of, of Zorro Zaurre. As you can see in the shape of the buildings, also it's important that uh, in this master plan of Zaha Hadid, that uh, as you are crossing the central street, you can see the water in both sides. And there are quite a lot of new public spaces or private spaces also among the buildings for new green areas. Uh, the whole area is 839,000 square meters. The ownership is uh, quite balanced, we can say. 51% is public and 49% is private. Uh, among the privates also, we have quite a lot of differences. I mean, we have tiny, prop uh, tiny properties and big properties also. So uh, to manage uh, with all these private uh, owners uh, has been quite a, sometimes a nightmare. But uh, fortunately, we, we have managed to, to go ahead and, and, and transform this area of, of Zorro Zaurre. Among the publics, the main ownership is owned by the Basque government, and the city council is the second most important public institution in this whole area. As I have said at the beginning, it's a mixed-use uh, district. Uh, we have 74% uh, of the use is residential, with uh, nearly... 5,500 uh, housing units, 50% of them, they are going to be social and affordable housing, and 26% of the land will be for economical activities that they are located in the northern point and in the southern point, those blue uh, spaces, where uh, we are promoting a techno park, an urban techno park for new activities connected with high-tech uh, companies. <clears throat> uh, and if you see the distribution also of the residential uses, the social housing and the free market housing also they are mixed. So we don't have, we can say, uh, the, the rich part and, and, the, and the workers uh, building separated in this neighborhood, but they are all mixed in the whole, in the whole area because we want to, uh, to have the, this kind of neighborhood with a balanced distribution of all the uses. Um, we have not banished everything. We have not demolish everything that was existing in the whole island. Uh, we have preserved the memory of the island and we have provided public subsidies for the restoration, for the rehabilitation of the 16 buildings. 6.6 .6 million euros of public investment, public and private investment have, has been provided to those uh, buildings that are preserved, uh, 42 buildings that gathers 164 dwellings. Uh, have already been uh, re rehabilitated, restored uh, through this uh, subsidy and this technical advisory that the municipality have has provided to, to these neighbors. And we have also preserved some of the industrial and port elements in these public spaces so that we can preserve also that industrial memory of this whole area of Zorro Zaurre. But uh, as I have said, uh, probably one of the most complex uh, elements has been the the works that must be done previously to this transformation, the demolition of those industrial buildings and the decontamination 
of those polluted soils that we had in, in this area of Rosaure. We had to, to treat, to decontaminate 285,000 square meters of this uh, district of uh, Rosaure. We, we received some uh, European finance for, for this, but main uh, of the investment has been done uh, via the, the, the budget uh, provided by the public institutions and the private owners of this area of uh, Rosaure. Apart from that, uh, this area of Sorosabre used to get uh, flooded when the when the tide is very high, uh, and so to protect the whole area and the whole island from uh, floods in the future, all the island has been elevated 1.5 meters over the actual level. So we can we have we have taken on account the worst flooding situation in the city, and also we have correct the height taking on account the probable uh, increase in the height of the sea level so that the whole district is flood protected. Uh, but uh, as we have some buildings that are not demolished, later we will see how we are protecting those ones that are not being elevated uh, in, as uh, the new buildings uh, will be. Uh, all the island will be served by uh, electric public transport uh, systems. Uh, and uh, we are trying to build also with uh, uh, emission-free uh, systems so, so that um, all the new buildings will be also uh, be served with geothermic and heat pumps. The geothermic system is being invested, the investment for this geothermic system is being done by the public institutions, by the municipality, but later the management of this geothermic system will be by a private partnership. So it's going to be a shared public-private uh, system, the management of this geothermic system in the island of Sorosaure. As I have said also, it's important to recuperate the spaces for the pedestrians and try to gain new green areas in the island. So all the driveways that are actually in the riverbanks are going to be transformed in pedestrian promenades. And the tram is going to cross the island from one corner to the other in, uh, from a central axis of, uh, of the island with four tram stations. And this tram also is going to run over a grass surface that is going to cross that central street in the, in the island. The promenade in the right riverbank of this space has already been transformed. Uh, in some places where there, was, where there was a risk of floods uh, when we have high tide up, uh, we have introduced a pipe of 1.5 meters uh, diameter so that we can gather the rainwater when the tide is very high and is raining, and we can release that rainwater to the river when the tide is low. That way we have avoid the risk of floods in this area. This is the previous situation of this area of uh, the right river bank of the area of Sorrosaure, and this is how it looks like actually with this urbanization already done uh, and trying to connect also the, the water and the pedestrian space through these uh, stairs uh, that we have uh, built in next to the promenade. Uh, also, we have introduced uh, species that are adapted to this uh, salty uh, space, we can say, so that they are adapted to, to live next to the sea in these new gardens that have been built in, in this right river bank promenade. And as you can see, the promenade also has two different levels so that uh, even when we are, we are in the worst situation of flooding in the city, uh, only the lower part of the promenade will be uh, flooded and the buildings will be protected every time as they are higher, uh, taking on account that flooding uh, level. And also, as I have said, the probable increase in the sea uh, level in the future. Uh, this is another view of that river bank, right river bank of the area of Sorosaure and a view of the island previously. And this is how it looks actually, with the promenade already finished. <clears throat> Those structures that you can see on the left side that look a little bit like cranes, uh, they are uh, structures to cover a playground that we have uh, below. Uh, that way we provide shade in summertime for the children that they are playing in that play, uh, playground. And we protect the children also in wintertime from the rain. Uh, this is a view of that playground covered in that uh, right river bank. And as I have said, as we are not demolishing everything in the in the island, we're increasing uh, the height of the whole island 1.5 meters. Uh, but we are protecting the existing uh, buildings that, of course, they are lower with a, a wall uh, that is being built alongside the promenade 
to protect those uh, buildings that they, they are remaining in that uh, front of the, of the river. And as we had done in the other uh, part of the, of the canal, uh, we are building also here rainwater tanks to gather the rainwater when the tide is very high so that we can uh, assure that there's going, not going to be any kind of flood uh, of flooding in this uh, lower part of the of the island and as i have said when the tide is getting down uh, those tanks will release the water to the river uh, again this is a view of a space that has already been transformed in the island this uh, was a, a screw producing factory that has been transformed in a university a uh, university with a public at the end, the university in video games and digital design, and we have the University of Mondragon that is uh, centered uh, that provides studies in uh, for industrial activities and advanced services. Below this square, there are the geothermic systems, and also that uh, square that you can see in the middle uh, of the urbanization is another rain tank, that uh, rainwater tank that uh, protects this whole urbanization from flooding in those uh, critical, we can say, situations when we have uh, the tide very high and we have uh, quite intense raining uh, falling on top of this space. Apart, as I have said, we are gaining new green areas in the whole area of Zorro Zorre. Most of them, they are going to be public green areas, but also among the buildings, they are going to be private gardens. And in these uh, new parks, we are trying to introduce local species, uh, local varieties of uh, trees and other vegetable uh, species to recuperate, to introduce these green areas into the urbanization of the island and to connect the blue and the green in these uh, corners of, of the island so that we will have the, the traffic and the public transportation system in the middle of the island and both corners, the, the ones that are facing the water, that they are going to be pedestrian spaces and green areas. And this is how it looks, actually, the works that we have been doing uh, in this uh, development of the district of uh, Zorro Zaurre. Uh, the space that can be seen on the left side uh, next to the, to the water uh, also has been a space gained uh, to the canal, has been filled through a private partnership. In fact, the old investment for uh, living both parts of the river with 75 meters wide has been done through via uh, in private investment. It has been a, pri a, a private company, the one that has, has invested in this uh, hydraulic work. Uh, and the uh, investment uh, done will be recuperated by the buildings that are going to be built on top of this land that has been refilled uh, so that both parts of the river have, have the same width and that way, the hydraulic uh, function of the of the river is better than the one that we had previously to the opening of the canal. And that's all. I'm open to to questions and discussions afterwards. Thank you very much. This is a view of how it was the island before we started opening the canal. Uh, so you can see all the factories there. Thank you. Thank you very much. As yeah, that was. Thank you for doing this presentation. The very interesting case of Zorotzare in Bilbao. Uh, it was very interesting to see how you managed to incorporate this blue and green infrastructure into this larger urban regeneration project and how biodiversity was also addressed there. And the nature-based solutions which were used uh, as mechanisms to help with the flood control in the area. So we already have one question in the Q&A box, but perhaps before that, I would just like to make one question myself just to start the debate um so you mentioned that the the project is funded of course with uh, by the public entities owning this land but also the private owners of this land and i think this is particularly interesting because it's it's a bit different from the traditional ppp that we see where there is a a big special purpose vehicle which aggregates some companies and carries out the investments and then the operation of the infrastructure. So I just wanted to understand, perhaps to ask you and to, to try to understand a bit more, what was the arrangement between this private and public owners and how did they share the risks and uh, the responsibilities for the financing of the project? Uh, well, uh, when after doing the 
the design of the whole project, the whole area of uh, Solosaurre, we we have uh, created, uh, we can say, a round table where we are all the main owners of this uh, whole area of Solosaurre. Uh, it had been possible to go ahead with this transformation because there were uh, a few private investors that uh, bought important uh, fields uh, in the whole area of Sorosaurre. So together, the publics and the privates in this first stage of the transformation of the district, we were gathering around 70% of the ownership of the of the area. And so uh, we went ahead and the smaller owners had to follow us uh, because there is no option of uh, getting stopped, we can say. You, you must choose if you are on the ship and you are going ahead with the project, you must pay what you have to pay in the percentage that is is yours because you have a, the same amount of ownership in that area. And if you are not going to pay the amount that is is your responsibility because of the percentage of ownership that you have, then you must leave the project and so the others can buy you uh, your percentage of ownership. Uh, so it's a decision of the private at the beginning of all the project to decide whether they are in or out of the project. If you are in, you must pay the percentage that is uh, your responsibility because of your percentage of ownership. And if you are not going to pay the part that uh, corresponds to you, then you must leave the project. That's very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Hazier. For the clarification, and actually, I still have many questions I would like to ask you about this. It seems like a fascinating case. I, I, but... I, must, I must say that as I have shown in my slides that uh, we have uh, offered public subsidies for the restoration of the 16 buildings, the few resident people that were living previously in the island are out of this project. So uh, they keep the ownership of their own buildings, of their own flats, uh, no residential existing building has been demolished in this operation. There were only around 300 people living in the area of Sorosaurre before we started with this transformation. So we have maintained those tiny houses that you can see in the picture. And we, and we have provided public subsidies to restore and rehabilitate them. And they are out of this operation. So the uh, neighbors that they were previously living there they don't have to pay uh, apart from restoring their houses. When I'm talking about uh, the owners that must pay, I'm talking about the industrial uh, owners of those that they were owning uh, brownfields in, in this area of uh, Cerro Sobre. Those, ones, those are the ones that are, they are obliged to, to pay or leave the project. Okay, yeah, it's much clearer now, but thank you very much for explaining. Uh, I don't want to take too much time uh, with my own questions, so I'll hand it over to Maria, who will address the questions in the Q&A box. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Andre, and thank you, Sierra, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have one question from the Q&A from Benjamin, who is curious to know what are the mechanisms and incentives that you've put in place to ensure procurement of local species, uh, what you were mentioning before, versus perhaps a lack of local producers, high costs, uh, perhaps uh, public market regulations, et cetera? Well, uh, I must say that uh, all the uh, species selected for the green areas are, uh, we can say, overviewed by the gardening department of the municipality of Bilbao. That is the one that is uh, approving the selection of species that are done in all the urbanizations that are done in this uh, area of Sorosaure. It doesn't matter if the one that is doing the work is public or private. If we are talking about an, an space that is going to be uh, of public use, uh, that urbanization project, including the, the selection of species, must have the approval of the gardening department of the municipality of Bilbao. And that point is the way that we can control which species are planted in each uh, part of, of uh, the project. Uh, not, not only the species that they are plant, but also uh, uh, the, the watering systems that they, those species need in uh, those gardens 
also are overviewed by the gardening department of the municipality of, of Bilbao. Uh, till the moment, we, uh, as, as I know, uh, we didn't have any problem to get uh, the species that we need for this garden. So uh, we have enough providers around to provide the, the, the species, the trees or the plants that we need for this kind of urbanization. Uh, so uh, till the moment, uh, we didn't have any problem to, to get the, the plants or the trees that we needed for this kind of urbanization. Thank you for explaining. And I hope this answers Benjamin's question. So looking at the time, maybe I, I um, give the word back to you, Andre. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much, Azier, once again, for the wonderful presentation and for your explanations. Uh, moving on to our next speaker. So now Ms. Panchuela is going to present her, do her presentation. So Ms. Panchuela is currently a PhD candidate at the Research Center of Ecology and Environment of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. She has nearly a decade of experience in urban ecological protection and management, particularly in biodiversity conservation and land ecological, ecological assessment in Shenzhen. Currently, she works at the Belt and Road Environmental Technology Exchange and Transfer, Transfer Center in Shenzhen, which is responsible for the exchange of knowledge and technology in the fields of urban ecology and biodiversity conservation. So Ms. Shrilian will talk about the Belt and Road Cooperation case sharing with a specific look into the Futian mangrove conservation area in Shenzhen as well. So the floor is yours, Ms. Shrilian. Thank you very much for joining us here. Oh, Shop uh, thank you for Eclipse invitation. I'm hearing to present uh, uh, the case, uh, the cooperative case uh, by uh, Belt and Road uh, uh, Environmental Technology Exchange and the Transfer Center in Shenzhen. Thank you. Daji,介绍一下我们那个深圳市的一些双端性保护的一些工作和一些我们这几年开展的一些工作。第二部分呢,就是我可能介绍一下我们这个单位,我们这个单位它是一个怎样的一个平台,它我们平时作为一些工作
丧失的一个这样的一个局面。A a quick introduction of the global background of the Kunming Montreal Bio,、uh, global biodiversity framework adopted by COP15, and the, the overarching goal of the global biodiversity conservation by 2030 is take urgent actions to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. China, as the COP15 leader, is hoping to 持续推动昆明框架协议的一个落实。然后，今年我们一月十八号，我们中国这边也发布了中国最新的生物多样性保护行动计划、保护战略与行动计划。希望通过这个行动计划，第一个就是来，首先就是要全面的提升我们中国自己的生物多样性的一个治理水平。第二个就是通过这个行动计划来切实的落行落实昆明昆明框架。为推进全球的生物多样性的一个治理，推进昆明框架的一个实现，做出我们中国的一些贡献。同时，我们中国也会将生态文明领域的合作、生物多样性保护这项工作作为高质量共建“一带一路”的一个重点内容。Uh, here is a brief introduction of China's biodiversity actions, and to highlight that with the approval of the State Council,、uh, MEE China has just issued、uh, China's NBCEPs、uh, on January 18th、uh, this year, and uh, uh, and also to highlight that uh, as a center, uh, the center, the Uh, Miss Pan Workheit,、uh, they will make cooperation in the field of ecological civilization as a key part of the high-quality Belt and Road cooperation to provide Chinese wisdom and Chinese solutions、uh, for building a community of life and for man and nature,、uh, especially in the countries、uh, on Belt and Road countries. 接下来我们介绍一下，在中在深圳，它作为一个超大城市，它是如何开展生物多样性保护的。深圳作为中国的一个超大城市，它的陆域面积它是不超过两千平方千米。二零二三年，它的生产总值达到了三点四万亿，他们实际管理的人口超过了两千万，它的人口和经济的活动的那个密度，在我们那个超大城市是居于首位的。呃，深圳，呃，深圳 as a mega city in China is located, uh. In North Tennessee, and、uh, with a land、uh, land area of uh one thousand uh over uh nearly two thousand square meter kilograms, and、uh, with a very high population, and、uh, it is uh the first uh among the uh the density of population and economic activities ranks first among uh mega cities in China. 深圳，它在那个经济和社会高速发展的同时，它也保有非常丰富且典型的区域生物多样性。就是据我们那个白皮书的一个记载，我们深圳目前的那个维陆域的维管束植物大概有两千八百六十种，然后我们的那个陆域脊椎动物大概有五百八十五种，其中观鸟类的那个数量就占我们中国全国的四分之一。然后我们以深圳自己的本地特色物种，以深圳命名的物种大概有二十多种。Uh, as is all written in the slide, I will don't I will not go into details. Uh, to be my uh also uh to mention that uh, the bird species in Shenzhen occupy almost uh one quarter of the whole uh China uh bird species, and、uh, there are over twenty species is named after Shenzhen's local uh. Named uh by Shenzhen, uh Shenzhen named by Shenzhen, and、uh, there are over one hundred and two uh twenty eight species of wild animals and plants and the state key protection, uh in Shenzhen. 在深圳这些年生，他们其实，在生物多样性这方面，政府主导，他们也做了非常多的一个工作。第一个就是我们。二零二一年的时候，就是给全国的生态系统定价，他给青山绿水定价，然后建立了第一个生态系统生产总值的核算制度的一个体系。二零二一年的五月二十二号，我们也发，我们深圳市发布了我国首个地级市的生物多样性的一个白皮书。同时，在二零二二年五月二十二号的时候，我们也发布了我们深圳市的生物多样性保护的行动计划。用这个行动计划来统筹我们全市的生物多样性的一个保护工作。
Shenzhen is the first Chinese city to establish the country's uh, complete uh, ecosystem growth protection accounting system to price green water and green mountains for green development. Also, Shenzhen has published uh, it's the first Chinese prefecture level city to, uh, to publish the biodiversity white paper. And uh, also, Shenzhen has published its uh, LBSAPs uh, in 20. Uh, on on May twenty second of twenty twenty two. Then, we, um, Ubaimidafuban 全球的生物端性保护来分享或者是共同探讨全球的生物端性的一个保护 uh, Shenzhen has established the 27 nature protected areas and also Shenzhen uh, of uh, and also Shenzhen has built up over 1238 uh, city parks also uh, in 2022 at Ramsar COP 14 it was proposed proposed by President Xi Jinping to establish an international mongrel center in Shenzhen. Also, Shenzhen has received the title of Biodiversity Charming City during uh, CBD COP15 and also signed up to the platform of cities with nature. And Shenzhen hopes to cooperate internationally and to deepen the international exchange uh, and so on. Thank you. 基于这些我们深圳的生物端性保护的一个实践的工作，就是我们也想把这些实践，然后去我们带到我们那个“一带一路”国家，跟“一带一路”国家去合作，然后开展相关类似的一个生物端性保护的一个工作。呃，build uh, on Shenzhen's rich experience in a uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, uh, we would like to bring this experience to the. Belt and Road countries and to uh to cooperate more and to build some uh international cooperation in the uh field. So just I now 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 I Bogo uh, so the Belt and the Road Environmental Technology Exchange and the Transfer Center is uh, is built uh, by the MEE of China and the Shenzhen Municipal Government together with Longgang District uh, Government. And uh, the purpose of the center is to carry out green technology exchange cooperation and uh, drive industrial and technology transfer, promote environmental protection cooperation between China and uh, countries along Belt and the Road and jointly build a, a, green, a greener Belt and the Road. That 
带到“一带一路”“一带一路”的那些国家。Uh, here are some examples of uh, the demonstration projects done by the uh, by, done by the center and including environmental monitoring and the domestic sewage treatment and uh, several other projects you can see from the slide, including also the MBS projects. 同时呢，我们会就是经常开展跟“一带一路”那些国家开展一些培训，然后培训的时候，我们也会带他来到我们深圳，然后看看我们跟关于那个一些好的项目，例如说大沙河长廊，这就是关于那个河流治理的，公共河流那个治理的，包括深圳市抽水蓄能电站，这是一个很。包比亚迪的公司总部，然后超级湾总部、腾腾讯的总部，还有一个就是洪湖水质的一个净化工程，然后包括我们建的一些植物园、红树林的一个自然保护区，以及我们大鹏半岛的一个自然保护区，就是让他们过来体验一下，就是在高速发展的城市，他们的生物端，我们是怎么将城市里的生物端性的保护和城市的高速发展融合起来。Uh, we also provide some training uh, set visits for these uh, countries along Belt and Road, uh, including we have some uh, demonstration bases in Shenzhen, including Dashahe Ecological Promen uh, Promenade, uh, which is an ecological uh, and uh, biodiversity project in Shenzhen as a mega city and also uh, including the uh, Shenzhen uh, promo storage power station and also like BID cooperate headquarters, Tencent cooperate headquarters. These uh, big uh, enterprises in Shenzhen has built their uh, their headquarters as an ecological park and which uh, has a very good demonstration of Uh, this project also the Futian Mugro uh, Nature Reserve Park is also a PPP project. Uh, have very high demonstration value in Shenzhen. 然后我现在就是再给介绍一下，就是刚刚说的一个由政府主导，然后但是是企业投资的一个合作的项目。这个项目就是这个项目就是我们“一带一路”在我们。我通过我们“一带一路”的这个平台，然后在泰国做的一个推动他们由电气化转型的一个项目。呃、uh, ，Here I, I will、uh, take example of some、uh, cases we did in Thailand, and、uh, with the active support of the Center Shenzhen Tailing Technology Group as a private sector has signed a cooperation agreement with、uh, Thai、uh, government branches and、uh, has did、uh, some. Uh, green energy project in Thailand, uh, with, uh, local governments and all uh, national governments and private private sector engaged in the project. 就是前期我们可能了解到泰国他他们自己也在倡导倡导一个泰泰国他们自己也在倡导以电代油的这种。这个工这个工作就是政府他们倡导一电代代油。泰国它是一个摩托车非常多的一个国家。然后了解到这个需求之后，我们通过联合国联合国规划署跟我们就是跟泰国那边，然后我们介绍我们台林的那个科技公司跟泰国那边联系。然后台林的科技公司它是针对泰国当地的一些情况和路况，重新为泰国设计了关于能在泰国。泰国上用的那个电动摩托车，然后设计了这个电动摩托车之后呢，他们通过联合国把这个摩托车，它是赠送给泰国，让他在那赠送五十台给泰国，让他之前免费先试用一段时间。Uh, we have done some research that uh, uh, Thailand is actively actively uh, promote uh, to use a uh, green energy motorcycle instead uh, instead of the uh, petrol driven traditional motorcycles and uh, with this background uh, we uh, we encourage uh, the, the Thailand group to uh, to design a specific motorcycle green motorcycle uh, use electricity Uh, for Thailand road and uh, have uh, to pilot with uh, 
53 uh, free motorcycles and to test uh, uh, in the city and with the support of UNIP and uh, local and national uh, government branches in Thailand. 然后这个项目它是已经在那个泰国举行启动了仪式然后这个捐赠仪式已经完成然后现在的摩托车已经在泰国使用我们就是做这个项目的目的了就是为了我们要积极想要发挥摩托车在以电带油的一个示范作用加
以上就是基本上我对那个我们和我们中心的一个介绍，包括我们合作项目的一个介绍。同时，也欢迎大家就是在我们中心那个品牌上做一些交流，有一些新的一些合作技术，包括声波性保护的技术，然后然后基于自然的一些技术，然后大家也欢迎大家一起来交流，然后为我们为。为中国、为为“一带一路”国家的一些生物多样性保护做出一些贡献。呃、uh, ，Thank you. 呃、uh, ，Here, 呃、uh, ，That's all for my introduction for the cent the work of our center, and、uh, we looking we are looking forward to uh to have more exchange with you on uh green development and uh nature based solution and other uh other projects and.、Uh, Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Pan Shuilian. Thank you, Yijiang, for the translation. Uh, we're already seven minutes over our scheduled time, but perhaps I can just to not lose this opportunity, just to ask one quick question to Ms. Pan. Um, so just to understand how does the Belt and Road Environmental Technology Center? Work with the local and regional governments,、uh, both in China and in other countries, to ensure、uh, the success of this of this PPP, such as the mangrove nature reservation project. Uh, Pan 老师，呃、uh, ，Andrew 他是问，就是呃， uh, 我们中心呃、uh, 有没有什么样的经验来协助地方政府来更好的。呃，达成这种就是政府和企业合作的项目。嗯，就是现在我们中心它是这样的，就第一个就是因为我们中心的那个平台，然后我们中心相当于一个平台。第一个就是我们跟政府关系，他们之间的关系是非常密切的一个关系，就是我们会收集定期的开展一些交流会，然后收集各个政府，包括“一带一路”一路的国家，他们关于。于生物多样性保护，还有一些那个投资项目的一个需求。然后我们收集了这些需求之后呢，我们就会在我们，然后联系一些企业，然后对准他们政府的需求，我们会把企业的一些产品和技术，就是一对一的有针对性的，就跟企跟政府和企业进行对接，让他们就是需求和企业进行匹配。同时，因为我们是一个官方背景的一个平台，所以企业跟我们合作。就是他虽然对“一带一路”国家他不是很了解，但是通过我们这个平台，他们就是他们双方能够很信任的达成一个，嗯、呃，就是相当于项目的一个合约，或者是合作，或者是这样子的一个关系。呃、uh, ，Miss Pan stated that, uh, at the center work very closely with, uh, local governments both in China and on. Countries, uh, along Belt and Road, so they, uh, from time to time, they collect information from these local governments for what need they have on their, uh, green invest investment, uh, or nature investment, and they, because they have this government built background, so they have naturally have the trust of the, uh, the. Enterprises locally, so they communicate with this private sector and to uh to convey the information that uh, uh the need of uh respective local governments and to a、uh, bridge between the two sectors and uh, uh to match the information and、uh, to promote the cooperation. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Pan Shulian. Thank you very much, Yi Jiang. Very interesting case. I think、uh, it really showcases how this such a this kind of center can help bridge some of the capacity gaps in some of the municipalities to also understand their needs and reach out to the private sector and communicate this need. So, I think this was very interesting for us to hear.、Um, as I said, we're already going over time, so unfortunately, we have to end our webinar here. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Mr. Azia Robles, for your very interesting presentation about Zorotzara in Bilbao, and thank you very much, Ms. Panchvelian, for your also very interesting presentation.、Uh, finally, I'd also like to enjoy to invite you all to join us in this afternoon session, which will address the same 
same same topic as we did this morning. So tapping into private sector investment for nature-based solutions and biodiversity projects. Uh, this time we'll count with the expertise and experience from specialists from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, from Metafor in Italy, and also from the experience in the city of Campinas in Brazil. Uh, and after that, the next series of webinar in this in the, our Interact Bio webinar series will take place on the 17th of April, where we'll also we'll discuss leveraging innovative finance mechanisms for nature-based solutions and biodiversity projects. So thank you very much, you all, for joining us here today. And I hope you enjoy this, this webinar and gather some insightful uh, from this insightful experiences here. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. A nice day. Thank you.